I'm super excited for us to get started. We have Phil in the house. Um, so very, very excited um, to be able to get together. Phil is an amazing person. And I know that I've shared with you guys a few times. I've been bragging on him. We uh, we did hope that he was going to be able to be in Canberra. But you know what? <laughs> he went to Hawaii, which I'm going over there, which I'm kind of going, you know what, I think he actually did okay, because it was freezing in Canberra. <laughs> but um, yeah, but hopefully next, another time we're going to be able to have him live in the room physically with us. But you know what, this is the next best thing, because um, yes, he got to share some content via a video he prepared for us. And then you guys have had the privilege of being in his course um, since conference. This, we get to be able to come together and dig even deeper into some of the amazing wisdom that Phil has. But I am going to read a little bit from his bio, just because I really do want us to, and I know some of you weren't able to be here at lunchtime, so I am going to send this recording out to you guys later this evening. Um, that, so if you're watching on the recording as well, um, this, this gentleman um, is just such a servant-hearted leader. I have gotten to know him over the last couple of years especially with his work with the DSA and um, how he serves our profession is just second to none um, however he's a big deal across the world in many professions I want to read a little bit about Phil he's an executive advisor speaker and writer in the subject areas of meaning leadership and high performance his insights into personal mastery and career acceleration have gained him a cult following among many high performers in fortune listed companies in the world over. And he's literally just landed back in Australia um, from where have you just been? You've been somewhere in the States, wasn't it? Nashville. Nashville. Oh, Nashville last week. That's right. <laughs> Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Actually, Tennessee, the home uh, of Juice Plus. Memphis is where our office, world office is. Um, <laughs> He has worked in more than 40 cities globally and counts Microsoft, the AFL, Universal Music, and the Commonwealth Bank amongst his clients. He's the founder of Switch L plus D and a bespoke learning and development partner for leading brands around the world. And we are very, very blessed to have Phil to share more of the insights um, from what it is that, you know, he again has been teaching us as part of the course. So much of it, I want you to listen with open hearts, open minds on how what he speaks to you about today can impact not just your Juice Plus business, we're about the whole person. And so I know myself, even what I've been learning from Phil, I've applied as much in my personal life as I have in business. So Phil, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us today. So appreciate you, my friend. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And hello, everybody. I can see you here on the grid. And then just so you know, uh, I've got a chat window down here. And obviously, depending on the size of the group and whoever uh, lands in here, I'm actually really thrilled that it's small. And you know why? It's because we're going to get to have great conversations. You know, the design of this particular session is designed as a series of gateways. You know, there are conversations for the crowd and there are conversations around a coffee table. The kind of conversations that we want to have on this particular call are like those conversations around a coffee table. The ones where we'll kind of roll up our sleeves and really inquire around the edges of some of the ideas that you've been having as you've worked your way through the convergence materials. Now, um, I have uh, some of the the kind of the, the physical copies in the world, obviously, but you know that in order to get these these ideas out as far as we possibly could, we have kept them digital. And so we know now that tens of thousands of folks around the world every single day are using their convergence journals, um, which is a really exciting thing for me. But you've probably experienced yourself that these are a good starting point but the invitation, the deeper invitation is for you to work out uh, your own reflections, your own strategies for perpetual growth. So with your permission, I would like to have a conversation with you. How does that sound? And this is a non-rhetorical question because I can see you all. I would love to know with a nodded head, does that conversation sound okay today? Good. So in the chat, let's get started. What I would love to ask is, first of all, just some really simple baselining questions. I wanna know who I'm talking with here. Um, have you all had the opportunity to work your way through this, the book itself, yes or no? Yes. 
Give me a nod or write yes in the chat. Okay, good. Varying response, nearly finished, not yet. Okay, a brush through. Okay, cool. So this is, no apologies. So what we'll have the opportunity to do then is maybe access some of these ideas for the first time and do it in such a way that kind of like goes in between the lines of this particular book. Um, so you know that Convergence is a system that we've designed in order to help people um, elevate their sense of meaning, uh, elevate uh, a real genuine high performance at work every single day. We know, and from my personal experience, there are two primary forums uh, for our impact and for our sense of fulfillment, our sense of contribution in the world. And these are unscripted ideas. Like I said, this has got to be a conversation today. I feel like there are two primary forums in life for the development of who we are and our ability to give back and contribute to the world. Um, the first is work. I think you would agree with that. The second is our intimate relationships. I think those two forums are the places where we touch down in the world most and hold the greatest lessons for us. Has that been your own experience as well? Is that if you are going to grow, if you're going to change, you show up most, your, your change over time shows up most in your intimate relationships, how you relate to other people, and then also your ability to contribute and earn and grow and evolve as a human being really shows up in work. Is that fair, yes or no? Just a nod of the head is okay with me on this one. And so really convergence focuses more on who you are as a person, even more than it does uh, you as a professional, because we know this, and this is what I would encourage you to write down. These are thoughts straight out of the book, is that we'll never go professionally where we're afraid to go personally. Can I get you to write that down? We'll never go professionally where we are afraid to go personally. We'll never go professionally where we are afraid to go personally. With that in mind, we know this, that who we are as people is the ultimate work for us to do. I've found that people can be good at tasks <laughs> and suck at their job. <laughs> I've known that people can be great at their job uh, and have a really unfulfilling career. Have you ever met those kinds of folks? And I know that people can have great careers and really not be leading the kind of life that they want. And when they take a couple of steps back, I think our invitation as evolved human beings is to take steps back, is to constantly assess our scenario in life and to understand how do I draw the line between what I'm doing every single day and how that is compounding over time to build the kind of life that is fulfilling and satisfying for me as a human being. So Convergence is a collection of ideas that we have gathered over the better part of 15 years of practice life and working with an extraordinary set of leaders around the world. Really, on any given day, uh, our work is sitting knee to knee with uh, some of the more senior executives in business, um, senior leaders at Microsoft at the, at the highest level, not just Australia, we're talking globally, um, some of the greatest uh, leaders within uh, the music industry, both on the suit side and the creative side. We run all of the AFL's leadership development and we have learned this, that it doesn't matter how many courses you've done, how many certificates you've got on the wall behind you, how many books you've read, that all of those things uh, don't hold a flame uh, against who you are as a person and how you're showing up to work each day. You know this, you've met people whose minds are full of all the ideas that uh, exist with regards to leadership and high performance, but they still leave trails of human destruction behind them wherever they go. Could you imagine having done the Harvard offsite, the INSEAD live-in course for three months in Paris? Imagine that you've sat online and done all of the MOOCs and all the advanced studies. You've got a mind full of knowledge, but it doesn't show up in the way that you relate to other people. We know that that's possible. So Convergence is fundamentally a self-reflection strategy series to help you understand who you are, how you're showing up to life, the impact you are having on others, and how to refine that over time. What we've learned though, is that it doesn't take very long for you to really accelerate the quality of impact that you're having in life. And so this is what I would invite you to write down in your own notes today, that the tighter the feedback loop, the faster the growth. The tighter the feedback loop, the faster the growth. I know folks who set for themselves New Year's resolutions 
and it's really the one time of year that they think about who they are and what they want for themselves and how they're showing up and the rest of the time it's just kind of habitual behavior and repetition and just kind of going with the flow but what I have learned is that for folks who are prepared to reflect self-reflect recognize seek feedback from others that you can accelerate really, really fast. You can change yourself. You can change the quality of impact that you are having in life. And for me, the impact that we have in life is one of the more fulfilling things. And so Convergence then is this framework that asks us to bring together a series of ingredients that we already have. Now, forgive me for for landing some of the ideas that already exist in this book, but just checking in with the chat, it means that some people haven't quite got there as deep as they wanted to. So let me kind of finesse some of these ideas and then I'll teach some things that aren't in this book that I think are actually really, really quite important. The idea of convergence is that when you bring together two aspects of uh, your character, of your skill, of your traits, of uh, the way that you're showing up to life, that you can create something profoundly more impactful and valuable than that thing by itself. It doesn't mean that one or the other is less valuable. It means that when you combine them, you can create something of extraordinary value. So for instance, the combination of skill and substance is the combination that we've just been talking about. We know that there are people in the world who are full of skill but are lacking in the patience lacking in the resilience, lacking in the kindness, lacking in the empathy that is required to really unlock the potential of their skill. Honestly, some of the smartest people that I know are unfortunately are people that I don't really want to spend much time with. Uh, and because of that, their ability to create impact in the world is really stifled. I'm sure you've met folks like that who really genuinely believe that if they could just get smart enough, things are going to work out for them. But we know this. This is the year 2022. We've got the internet. It is no longer the domain of brute force intellect and volume of knowledge that is going to define your success and impact in the world. Your ability to create impact and build the kind of experience that you see for yourself is solely going to be determined on how you can harness the knowledge and the skill that you've got. And I believe that that is an aspect of substance that kicks in that is most important there. The way that I like to say it, and I would encourage you to write this down, please, is that my substance either amplifies or nullifies my skill. My substance either amplifies or nullifies my skill. I would sooner and you might think of this with your own teams and networks that you're creating and building and cultivating each day. I really would prefer to hire somebody of high substance and a high character and help them to acquire the skill that is required for that role over time. Then hire somebody who is wildly skillful, but you've got red flags right from the first conversation as to whether you want those humans in your team. You've heard the trite sayings around hire for character and backfill for skill. And I think it's true. Ideally, what we want is both in our teams, don't we? We want really deeply skillful people and people full of character. But I'm curious to know from you, when you hear the word substance, what is it that comes to mind? It is the bringing together of those two things that really matters. And in the book, what we talk about is that it's possible for folks to have all the ingredients that they need to succeed in life and create the kind of impact that they want. All the ingredients. But to have never been taught how to combine those ingredients in ways that actually produce the results that they want. Facetiously, we use the example of baking a cake. Now, maybe this is the example that you've gotten to so far in this book. The idea that it doesn't actually take too many ingredients to bake a cake. I don't know about you, whether you're a Betty Crocker kind of cake baker or whether you're a bake from scratch kind of baker, but it doesn't take too many ingredients, right? It really, really doesn't. Like I've been baking cakes with my daughter for years now and she's six. And maybe the big realization about life and leadership happened at a bench top with my six year old daughter not too long ago in thinking that you could have flour, you can have sugar, you can have eggs, you can have milk, you can have something to raise the whole sucker, you could have all the ingredients that you need. But it really does matter how you combine those ingredients 
that's gonna be the determining factor as to whether you end up with a cake or whether you end up with an awful mess in your kitchen. I mean, you could scramble the eggs, you could drink the milk, you could put the flour and the sugar together with a little bit of self rate, like you could do all kinds of things with those ingredients, but if you are setting out to bake a cake, there's a certain order in which you need to combine these ingredients. And you know what I found is that for so many folks, they do have the ingredients that they need, but no one has shown them how to combine them in ways that actually produce results. So if we cascade to this next layer, and really what we want to do is I want to get us to some conversations really, really fast. But this gap that exists between knowledge and what we do with the knowledge we have is one of the more critical gaps in all of business and life today. It might be something that you've experienced for yourself. I mean, they call it the FEFA gap. I'm gonna put it here in the chat. P-F-E-F-F-E-R, the FEFA gap, if you're taking notes, so that you can chase this one later on. The FEFA gap, named after the psychologist, the researcher, Charles FEFA, um, he just talked about, hey, there's a really dangerous gap for most human beings with regards to how they treat knowledge and information. I mean, last week, the World Web Index, this is maybe two weeks now, is a brand new study. Latest statistics that I have seen. They've said that the average social media user on the planet, this is the average, keep this in mind, is using social media for 147 minutes a day. Has anybody seen that report floating around in the last fortnight? Because it's quite a shocking number. 147 minutes. Let me put this in the chat so you can stare at that number because 147 minutes is about two and a half hours a day, depending on how you cut it, of dedicated social media time. Now keep in mind, and Ryan, I'm just gonna flick here in uh, the live scribe. So let's bring this up in just a second. I'm gonna flick over. We know this, that anytime you're looking at stats like that, that there's an average use, right? And so we're talking about the average user, middle of the bill. So this means that there's people who are using more than 147 minutes a day, and obviously a balance of less, but 147 minutes of social media a day? Do the maths on that. It adds up to about a year of dedicated time looking at social media in the coming 10 years. Now, I don't know about you, but it's fair to say that I think the world has become quite enamored in sucking in information. We're constantly learning new things. We have greater exposure to information in our lives than literally any other human beings ever before. All the cliches in regards to this but what matters isn't what we know about life and business and relationships and family and health. We really are defined by what we do with what we know. And what I'm interested in is helping people to do less better. I know people who are so dedicated to acquiring new knowledge. Have you got any friends who read a lot? I've got some friends who you know, are doing things like the 100 book a year challenge. A hundred books. Isn't that extraordinary? Now, clearly I like to read. Every single book back there is a book that I've actually read. I like to read. But my goodness, if I was the walking representation of everything that I have learned, I would be remarkable. The problem is there's a really sizable gap between what I know and what I apply. And the practices of convergence exist to help you better harness the knowledge that you've already got before you fall for the trap of thinking that your next great leap in impact, in growth, and potential in life is going to come out of something that you don't yet know. Let's test this one right now. Is there anything that you know about health that you don't currently put into practice? Yes or no? Is there anything that you know about health that if you put into practice, you would be a healthier person? Yes or no? This is a non-rhetorical question. I know we're getting personal and deep, right? I know things about health that if I actually put them into practice, I'd be a pretty healthy person. And you know, in the same way, I know things about my personal finances that if I actually put those things into practice, I would have more personal finances. Is anybody with me? Yes or no? I know things about how to be an elite father and an elite husband uh, that I don't put into practice. It's not because I'm foolish, it's because there's a gap between what I know and what I apply. And what we're interested in doing 
is enhancing the impact that we have in life and that's going to come out of closing the gap, converging what we know with what we apply. The encouragement in convergence is really quite simple, is to do less better. In fact, I'm gonna put this here in the chat and I want you to put it in your notes too, to do less better because when you understand that your impact in life is not going to be defined by the knowledge that you acquire, but by the knowledge that you apply, it is an incredibly freeing understanding of how impact and results is generated. It goes a long way to explain some of the folks that you know who, I don't know, we wanna be kind, but maybe are a few sandwiches short of a picnic basket. I have some friends who are not the brightest sparks on planet Earth, but my goodness, they are incredibly successful people because while they might have smaller knowledge than others, they maximize what that knowledge is. And I know folks who are like would just crush it on trivia night, know everything there is to know about things that don't matter for their impact in life and because of the gap between what they know and what they apply, uh, don't have the impact that they want. And so in this really conversational approach, what I would like for you to do is have a think. How do I better unlock the knowledge that I've already got? One simple question that I ask myself each day and around 3 p.m. in the afternoon is when I practice this one, because convergence is a series of practices, is what do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? Can I invite you to write that down in your own notes? What do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? This is a wonderful self-reflection question designed to bring out of your knowledge base opportunities for action, behavior, and growth. What do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? What do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? And you know, the simple task then becomes listening and having the courage to respond to the internal answer that comes back. And let me show you how simple this activity is, lest people complicate what high performance actually is. Let's ask the question now. What do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? Can everybody here, and I can see you all here, do me a favor, um, take a deep breath in. That's all. And then what I want you to do is on the inside, literally ask yourself that question. What do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? What's the first thing that comes back? And I wonder if you might write that down on a piece of paper. You don't have to put that one in the chat because it might be a quite a personal thing. Having the willingness to tap into that inner wisdom is quite a remarkable step for us all. And what I found is that sometimes people have a, uh, I'm gonna be gentle here, a stubbornness, a sense of procrastination, that, that first thought that comes back couldn't possibly be sophisticated enough. Couldn't, that couldn't possibly be the right thing. I don't know if any of you heard that first response that came back and said, no, 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 not that one. What's the second one? And you wanted to write down the second one and enact the second one. What I'm interested in is, do we have the courage to tap our inner wisdom and ask ourselves these kinds of courageous and simple questions like, what do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? And then go and do those things. Because what I've found Okay. Are we still live? Can everybody give me a thumbs up if we're still, we're still, if I'm still with you? Good. Okay, good. This one's going weird in front of me. We'll get that back in a moment. But what I found is that knowledge acquisition without application is actually a strange form of procrastination. Can I say that one again? Knowledge acquisition without application is a strange form of procrastination. In fact, I think it's almost the, the adult's favorite form of procrastination because we can convince ourselves that we are growing and changing and evolving, but mistaking the knowledge that we are acquiring. I mean, these folks that read 100 books in any given year, you know, facetiously, my favorite question to ask is, well, presumably a whole lot has changed for you. I mean, you, have to, you must have changed so much in a hundred books in the past year, God forbid that we're spending that much time acquiring new insights and never doing anything with it. 
You know, Muhammad Ali, one of his more famous quotes, a quote that I love to share, is that the person at 50 who was the same person they were at 20 has wasted 30 years of their lives. The whole point of life, from my perspective, is breadth of experience, change, evolution, becoming something bigger than we were before. And everything that we learn, every experience that we uh, enjoy in our lives, every challenging season, holds in it lessons that can propel us into the future. But we know that there's a difference between what we experience in life and the wisdom that we are able to distill in life. Have you ever met a 55 year old, 15 year old? <laughs> Those people who have lived many, many years, but still show up as though they are quite immature. Like we're, we're being facetious and fun and pokey with these kinds of ideas. But we know that there's a difference between time in the game and experience. Elapsed time holds so much potential for us to be extracting ideas and wisdom out of it. But I know people who are more devoted to the lives of others than they are in thinking about their own lives. I know this sounds wild and crazy, but think about it. Uh, I mean, my family, quiet just between you and me, we love a bit of Kardashians, you know? It, like this new season is great, it's back on, I dig it, I love it. But I'm worried that so many people know more about Kim Kardashian, her business dealings, her intimate relationships, than they do about the workings of their own lives. Imagine if they were as devoted to their own lived experience as they were the gossip rags, the gossip mags, and reality television. And then this is not being pokey or on a moral soapbox. What I'm interested in is us building a masterful existence for ourselves. And I have found that that's going to come out of <laughs> reflecting on our own lived experience, reflecting on our own life, building something that we're proud of. And so I'm working on some stuff here. I'm gonna make sure that we connect, connect. There we go, we're back. All right. And so knowledge and application is a simple one. And that simple question that you're asking yourself about what do I know to do that I'm not currently doing is a question that you can down tailor into different areas of your life. What do I know to do about my intimate relationships that I'm not currently doing? Go and do that thing. What do I know to do about health that I'm not currently doing? Go and do that thing. What do I know to do about marketing that I'm not currently doing? Go and do that thing. God forbid we ever get into this pattern of thinking that again, the next great breakthrough in our business, in our life, in our career is gonna come out of something that we don't yet know. When all of that time we're leaving on the table all of this unapplied wisdom, knowledge and experience. And I see this day in, day out, all across the planet amongst high performers and low performers. It's the same opportunity. And you could ask yourself these questions now, even instinctively. What do I know to do about my most intimate relationship that I'm not currently doing? Imagine if you did it. What do I know to do about marketing? Imagine if you did it. And it can become a powerful coaching question for you as well. A question for your team. When people feel stuck and they come to you for advice and wisdom, turn it back onto them. Help them to tap the inner wisdom of their own lived experience by asking them, well, why don't we just ask this question? What's one thing that you know to do that you're not currently doing? There's always an answer for that. Never once have I asked that question in any area of my life and not had something that I knew to do that I wasn't currently putting into practice. By going and doing those things, I have learned that wild growth is possible with the insights that I've already got. Lest we fall into this mistake of thinking that I've got to go and do an MBA. I've got to go and pay this money. I've got to go and, I believe in mentors and coaches. Of course I do. It's what I do day in, day out but they will be at their best when they are turning those questions back onto us. Now, like I said, this is not a keynote. This is me just shooting from the hip with regards to some of the better lessons that I would love for you to tap into with regards to convergence. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna bring up a live scribe. And so, right, I think we've got ourselves back together. And so let's bring up this. Um, slide if we've got it. Ryan, are we connected on the live scribe? Yes or no? Yeah, thanks. What I'd love to do as you all do this, and if anybody is curious 
uh, Ryan is our, there we go, is our technical director behind the scenes making sure this is possible. Good. And so if you're, uh, you know, uh, if Zoom is a work in progress for you, what you are able to do is take your cursor above the window in which I'm talking and click on fit to screen and it'll go the full view if that makes sense. So let's go to live scribe. And what we've got is this idea that I would like to share. This is absolutely an idea that I have seen propel the careers of people. I would invite you to draw this if you can. You can also take a screenshot. Um, and right, I don't think it is coming through, unfortunately. Quirks in the system today. Um, has everybody got a pen, yes or no? Hold up a pen if you've got it. Yeah. Okay, we've got quite a delay on this live scribe, but we'll get there eventually. What I'm going to do is draw up here a quadrant model that on the horizontal axis is our competence. And this one's gonna be a tricky one, Ryan. So yeah, there we go. But I think that one is gonna take a whole bunch of time to pull up. Yeah. I'm gonna give this five seconds. Otherwise, we'll just go back to our conversations. All right. Good. Is this live? Get in there. Thanks everybody for your patience. Technology is a thing, isn't it? And so on this horizontal axis, I want you to write competence. This idea of our lives being more than what we uh, know is a really critical idea. I know that there's not too many times in life where on this horizontal axis, that's got about a 60 second lag on that one, right? Um, is that we're not solely defined by our knowledge. And so just increasing competence over time is not gonna drive the quality of the results unless we are able to combine that with other and more powerful ideas. And so I'm gonna switch off the live scribe and just go back to full screen if that's possible. So on this, com on this layer of competence, I want you to imagine that we intersect that layer of competence with a layer of visibility as well. And I wonder if you might be able to draw that in your own notes somehow. It's just a simple quadrant model. So what we're gonna end up with is high competence and low competence and high visibility and low visibility. When it comes to creating impact in life, I have absolutely found that some of the more competent people don't create the impact that their knowledge deserves because they are invisible to the people that matter most to them. Does that make sense? Have a look at that competence model that you've built. High, high visibility, low visibility, high competence, low competence. Now from our perspective, what we're most interested in doing is moving towards high competence and high visibility over time. But let's quantify some of these definitions. Competence in your own notes, I would encourage you to capture these ideas. Competence is an output of your work ethic. Can everybody write that down? Competence is an output of work ethic. We know this, this is the, the work of Carol Dweck, the, San, the Stanford psychologist who really brought to the world the idea of the growth mindset. We know that if you are prepared to do the work, you will get very good at what it is that you do. There's no mystery about that. Uh, competence is directly correlated to the energy, the effort, the attention that you are bringing to new tasks. So we know this. Competence can be developed just with energy, effort, and attention. If I'm prepared to do the work, I will get good. However, it is possible to be very, very good at what you do, and no one knows that you exist. And it's a dangerous place to be trying to build a career, build a network, level up your impact in life from. So our opportunity is to increase visibility over time on the competence that we have and who we are as human beings. Now, visibility is really different. Visibility in your own notes, I want you to make some notes here that visibility is not the same as fame. This is a really critical distinction. Fame is being widely known. Visibility is being known by the right people for the right things. Can I say that again? Fame is being widely known. Visibility means being known by the right people for the right things. 
And so what we are after is visibility in the work that we do. Visibility comes down to the difference of knowing who we are trying to impact and impacting those people over time. And so what I'm going to encourage you to do, ah, this technology is a little bit lumpy today, so excuse us as we keep getting this done. If there's quirks for you, there's quirks for me on this side too, is understand that our competence is one thing, but elevating the visibility on our competence really, really matters over time. You can do that in really simple ways. I want you to think about in the coming year, who needs to know what you are capable of? Build a list of three people right now that if all you did was to become more visible by those three people, that your career would have the opportunity to blossom and grow. And the reason why this matters is because I know folk who have tens of thousands of followers across their social media, but who are invisible to the people that actually matter to the impact that they're trying to create in life. And could you imagine having tens of thousands of followers, but being invisible to the people that actually matter to you? Again, the spirit here is to do less better. Add to this model now, one more axis. And if there's any maths or engineering nerds in the room, you know that this axis is the one that comes out towards us. It adds depth to our quadrant model. And that axis is an axis of warmth. W-A-R-M-T-H, warmth. And warmth is literally this description of do people enjoy being around you? Can you feel connected? Are you doing life with people? Because in many, many ways, you can plot any brand or any impactful person on planet Earth in this model. Are they good at what they do? Are they known for, for being good at what they do? And do people like spending time with them? This ultimately is what we're trying to build. You know, there are some brands who are incredibly competent at what they do, incredibly well known for what they do, but are cold. And we're flipping out of personal life and into uh, conversations about brands here for a moment, but it's a great learning opportunity. I mean, I don't mean to put any organizations under, under the bus, I really don't, but you know, I have been giving Telstra, as an example, money every single month of my life since I was 17. Since I was 17, now I'm 39 now. That's a long business relationship as far as giving one organization a bunch of money every single month of my life, and I wonder, if you had a client, somebody who put money into your account for near on 30 years, how you would treat and honor that person, just calling this out. So let's think about like where Telstra would live on this quadrant model from my perspective. Focus group of one, high competence, oh, of course, through the roof. I wouldn't know the first thing about sending a signal off a satellite in the sky and make, that's voodoo as far as I'm concerned. Competence through the roof. Visibility through the roof, everybody in Australia who knows Telstra, absolutely every single person. But for me, they are not a warm organization, they are quite cold. Because every single time that I have an issue, I have to get on that phone for four hours at a time. Is anybody with me, yes or no? And we're being facetious here, but the opportunity is to think about what kind of human being that we wanna be. High competence, yes. Building that over time in alignment to tapping the knowledge that we've already got. And remember, how do we do that? By asking these simple questions. What do I know to do that I'm not currently doing? Yeah, Fuzia, sorry about that. Shout out to your husband at Telstra. My personal experience. High competence, yes. Be known for being good. And then also having that depth of substance that gives us that warmth. That's the territory that we want to exist. And so if we go back to our ideas here around the gaps between intention and action, so knowledge and application, I think, holds so much power for who we are as human beings. If we can tap that idea, we've got great potential. <sighs> but you know, we promised that this would be a conversation. And so we don't want to just kind of like dump knowledge without having real chats. I wanted to open the frame up here. So I want to ask you now, for even just the ideas that we've been able to share and scratch the surface on, what is it that comes to mind for you? 
What opportunities for growth do you see for your own self? I'm gonna pick on some people, otherwise we're gonna go straight into the chat here. But Melanie, there's been a bunch of head nodding so far in, in regards to some of these points. What comes to mind for you so far with regards to convergence and some of these bigger ideas? Do you wanna come off mute? Hello, Phil. I'm assuming I have Melanie on here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, go cool, for it. Cool. Yes. Um, the whole concept is like I can't believe I didn't do the work prior to coming to this call. I'm so sorry. I this is yes, I know so many people, and I have definitely been guilty of it myself in the past of reading stuff and learning stuff and then just not doing anything with it and that was that was wasted time and, and energy mm. to just have it sitting in my head um and sure some you know sometimes things will pop up and you go oh yeah I remember reading about that or learning about that uh, like 10 years of university will do that and then never actually having worked in the fields that I studied in will do that um but yeah just this whole you can yeah you can it's not about what you know it's about what you do with what you know and I just love that whole concept and I can't wait to get stuck into that. I've just found the link in the email from when I registered at conference to do the work after this call. Um, I just love everything about that. Yeah, <laughs> about it. You know, there's, oh, thank you. You know, there's this really wonderful story that is told about Jerry Seinfeld. Um, now Seinfeld uh, famously is the first billion dollar comic. He's the first person to, you know, like use words for a living, telling jokes that became a billionaire. Now, I don't know what your orientation in life is, right? So for me, uh, wealth is not the sole definer of success. For me, health and family, the quality of my relationships, my ability to do something meaningful in life, those all add up. And then finances are a part of that mix as well. So we'll be careful about the way that we tell that story. But I think you would agree with me that it's really remarkable to make a billion dollars from telling jokes, right? And so there was once upon a time, um, he sold at Madison Square Garden. Now this is not strange for Jerry Seinfeld to sell out a location. Um, but so the story is told, the National Speakers Association of the United States, like, you know, a big association in the United States, they were like, hey, if we could just ask you to come and speak to our members and teach them, what does it actually mean to like use words for a living in such a way that you impact so many people that that kind of impact and wealth is possible? And he said, sure, it's a one-off deal. It's not going to be a gag fest. Let me just kind of like tell you the secrets of what it actually takes to to kind of do this at this kind of scale. And so obviously they were excited. They opened up the ticketing to their members and they sold out really fast. They went from the Hammerstein ballroom really fast to like bigger events and eventually they sold out Madison Square Garden. This was the wildest opportunity ever. Could you imagine like a proper roll up your sleeves learning session with a guy like Jerry Seinfeld. No one had ever done it like him before. And this is about 20 years ago, really when he was at the peak of his powers. And so the story goes that Madison Square Garden was full. This is New York City. People were clamoring out in the cold to get inside. They finally get inside, like all rugged up with scarves and all the rest. And you could imagine like from the floor to the nosebleeds, just the room was full of anticipation. As you look down on the stage, just this big red curtain, kind of like a Foo Fighters concert. And then uh, uh, at the appointed hour, like the, the MC walked out and frothed about this person, Jerry Seinfeld, you know the guy, like jeans and like sneakers and the guy, hey, let me tell you a story. Like we're so excited and just built up Jerry Seinfeld. He said, he is here to tell us the secrets of creating impact. Like if you have any aspiration to create impact and work in life, this is a guy that can help us do it. So, and you know, like, and say, why don't we welcome Jerry Seinfeld? And the crowd literally went wild. This is so the story goes. And so here comes Jerry Seinfeld, walks across the stage, walks straight past the lectern, straight past it. This is in front of the red curtain. I don't know if you can picture it in your mind. Imagine that we're all sitting in the back row down Madison Square Garden with a pair of binoculars trying to understand what's about to go on. Walks across to the far side of the stage. There's this gold rope that is hanging from the top of the ceiling down to the stage floor and he pulls it and that red curtain falls to the ground. And there's a giant banner there that says, do the work. And then you know what Jerry Seinfeld does? 
waves to the crowd, and he walks off. <laughs> That's it. Like, I'm not even kidding. Um, the crowd was stone cold silent. You could imagine, like, some people in the crowd would have been, you know, like, going, ah, oh, what a classic. This guy's hilarious. He just walked off. Like, he'll be back. And then after 10 minutes, the house lights came on, and people were either completely pissed off they felt like they'd been ripped off. Imagine you had bought front row seats, 1500 bucks a ticket. Imagine you had bought 50 bucks to rub your pennies together for the nosebleeds. And you're thinking to yourself, this guy didn't teach us a thing at all. But you could imagine that there were some people in the room who completely understood what he was saying with that, that light bulb moment. Do the work. So the story goes, he was on Letterman the next night. Dave Letterman uh, doesn't kind of like hold punches in regards to this. He said, you just robbed New York City. You robbed like 15,000 people uh, last night. You told them that you were going to give them the secrets of success. Like what on earth happened? You walked off the stage. You didn't come back. I was in the show. And then Jerry Seinfeld said, no, no, no. They asked me what the secret was to my success. I gave it to them. And then he went on to tell stories of the depth of commitment to his craft. And I love this. It's masterful. He talked about locking himself in hotel rooms for long weekends, trying to take 12 word joke landing lines and make them eight word landing lines. He talked about sitting there and crafting joke after joke after joke after joke. He talked about going on the road when no one knew who he was, to do the work and hone his craft. And I love this idea that success is not a factor of being sprinkled with the special source by the gods. It is a matter of your intention and what it is that you're setting out to do with your life. And if you're prepared to do the work, then you can get good. And for so many parts of our life that are a mystery, that are a risk, and we're all experiencing this right now. It's October in 2022, rates have gone up again. Our investments are a little bit risky. Relationships are always a risk. Like we, we, we show up into our most intimate relationships where we're generous and we're kind, but there's a level of risk involved in so much in life. And this is what I love about the growth mindset and understanding how growth happens, that if you're prepared to do the work, you can get good, that that is not a risk. So I'm with you, Mel. This idea of learning to better harness the knowledge that I've already got before fooling myself, that growth might come out of something that I don't yet know, it's, it's preposterous, isn't it? I wonder, uh, who else might I pick on? Carly, what's coming to mind right now? Let's turn this into a real conversation because we've got content for days, but I think it's a rarer opportunity to talk. So, Carly, hit me. What do you got? You'll have to come off mute. He's walking away from right, the TV. Sorry, school it's, holidays, it's, right? it's school holidays <laughs> and I've got two boys <laughs> that are a bit boisterous. So I've just moved out of the room. You know, I think we've got um, a, either some me, technical or... challenges or a big old double loop. You lost me. So, Carl, I'm so you sorry. You might have lost me. <laughs> what we'll do is we're going to ask you instead um, to maybe throw some questions in the chat. So, for everybody else at home, why don't we uh, think about what is one aha moment so far in this conversation for you? What is one key question? What is one key outtake? And would you kindly put it in the chat? Because I think we're going to have a little bit more success with the way that this particular Zoom is playing out by using the chat really, really well. So Fuzia, Judith, Lindy, Kiara, Lizelle, Jade, I wonder if you might commit a question into the chat. An observation. Yeah, the idea that secret source exists is quite an uh, it's, it's an alluring idea and the reason why I think it's an alluring idea and I know that some people really reason why I like the idea of gifts and I don't want to step on people's toes here because I know that this is often oriented around a worldview and really sacred and special beliefs that some people are gifted at what they do 
But what I have learned is that it's one of the more offensive things to say to somebody who is really good at what they do to say, wow, you're so gifted, as though they haven't had to work for that skill like everybody else. It couldn't possibly be an educator and a teacher if I believed that people were simply gifted at what they do. When you see somebody in full flight from a skill perspective, really what you're looking at is a degree of practice and earned knowledge. And that should comfort us because we've all learned, heard of this idea of the law of 10,000 hours. Give me a nod of the head if you've ever heard of the law of 10,000 hours. This was popularized by a writer called Malcolm Gladwell. Well, and he was basing his work, that law, on a researcher by the name of Jeff Colvin. And they both together found that really elite performance and mastery is predictable across the line of practice, that deliberate practice can accelerate the quality of work that you do like nothing else can. No degree of potential, no degree of giftedness, no degree of luck or opportunity holds a candle against the idea of deliberate practice. So 10,000 hours is literally all it takes. Now, if you take the idea of 147 minutes a day <laughs> of social media, and if all you did was substituted that for deliberate practice in something that you care about, you will literally achieve mastery in your chosen field for a really simple substitution. Isn't that an interesting idea? That about two hours a day over the course of 10 years will not only make you good at what you do, will make you the best at what you do. That's what mastery is. And it's not that you have to wait until you're 10,000 hours deep that you get to start reaping the rewards of your effort, attention, and energy, and hard work. Most rewards will start to kick in after about 1,500 hours, so the research shows, because so many people are so thinly distributed across trying to do so many things that if someone is literally able to say, this is what I'm gonna get good at, I'm gonna pick this thing and go for it, I'm gonna go for growth in this area, that it is so easy to distinguish yourself while everybody else tries to spread themselves thin or is distracted to the point of no skill whatsoever. So I wonder if you would have the courage of picking something to go after and dedicating yourself to that. We know that 147 minutes a day, you might be a parent, you might be busy, you might be running other businesses, but imagine if you just cut that in half. If all you did was 45 minutes a day my goodness, six hours in every week to develop skill in a subject area that set you apart from everybody else. Absolutely extraordinary. So I encourage you to really dedicate yourself to something and go after it. Judith Ritz said this. Hello, Judith. Thanks for putting this in the chat. What do I know to do is that I'm not currently doing? Take action. I've set my intentions, goals, dreams, not time to step up and do the hard work. Basically starting in with this new chapter in my life, big 60 in December. Hey Judith, happy birthday. 60 is a hell of a milestone. Good things happen from 60 onwards. It's amazing. Such a great question. What do I know? Just popped it on a sticky note on my PC. Fazia, you said this. I feel that I've done the things that I need and want to do, but now I feel that I'm not being doing it right. Here's the interesting and wonderful thing is that the way that we feel about how things are going can be quite distinct from how things are actually going. Has anybody ever noticed this in life? That things structurally can be moving forward steadily and it still feels clunky. So there's the opportunity for Zia to actually better harness what we do have to move us closer towards what we're doing. And then also over time, better align the way that we feel about our lives with the results that we're getting. Jade says this, uh, I'm at work, haven't been able to engage probably, we can't wait to do re watch the replay. Off to a meeting, thanks Jade, good. And Lindy says this, such good. Uh, this can be the struggle we all have, I know what I should do, but I don't do. Can everybody write down in your own notes uh, when I remember to remember? Can you write that down? Remember to remember. And I know it sounds trite, but I found that this is an important distinction in the way that we achieve growth over the long term is that these things can't become something that we um, become cruel in our expectations for. What I have found is that growth really requires 
a whole bunch of self-compassion. And that fast growth is not possible without a lot of self-compassion. Now, self-compassion is not the same as self-care. So let's distinguish these. Self-compassion is relating to ourselves with kindness as we try and attempt new things. We know that the process of growth is a really clunky one, is that it's one filled with attempts and failures and corrections over time. And that if I don't have compassion for myself and how I'm showing up, that I might start to become cruel to myself and miss the point. Thanks, Lizelle, have a great afternoon. And so self-compassion would show up if you take the example of LeBron James, and it's a really interesting example because he's an elite performer. Somebody has learned to harness the skill that he's got for extraordinary impact. He's also famous for having spent $25 million on managing his health and his performance. For him, we know that as talented as he is, he works hard, yes, but he also rests and cares for himself and invests into his highest potential. If LeBron James was in the gym every single day, playing the game every single day, he would break down. And so high performance needs to be accompanied by high self-compassion and rest. There's no such thing as go, go, go all the time. Now, I've been told uh, that we might be able to go back to uh, our drawings here. And this would be a wonderful thing if this is possible. Right on. Okay. So we're back. We're back. Thank you, Ryan, behind the scenes. So what we worked on here just earlier is this ability to combine the competence that we have. And this should be as a comfort for everybody. Competence. Visibility. And warmth. And so what we end up with is this idea of thinking about who we are and how we are showing up to life in the third. If that makes sense, what we're trying to do is move into this upper right hand quadrant so that we are competent. But what I want you to know around the gap between competence and application, the gap between knowledge and application is that really there's a critical point here where you can recognize that you are good enough. Now, there's not too many times in life where you'll say things that good enough is good enough. But do you know what I have found is that so many people spend so much time getting good at things that they don't care about, getting brilliantly good at things that don't matter to them. And I would have you write it down in your own notes like this, that it doesn't matter how well I do the wrong thing. Can you write that down? It doesn't matter how well I do the wrong thing. There's an idea here that having achieved enough competence that your highest growth is going to come out of increasing visibility. And that means being known by the right people for the right things. And over time, building a life and a career that is full of warmth. And I couldn't think of a bigger way to accelerate and enhance your warmth than by being a generous and present person with the people around you. <laughs> I think in the time that we have, what I'd really like to talk about is this space, this gap between uh, our identity and our reputation. It's one of these areas that I think is a lot of fun to think about. And our opportunity is really, really profound in this area. You know, a lot of people ask me about um, legacy. Hey, Phil, you know, like, what do you think about legacy and impact? And I think legacy is an interesting question. This idea of creating impact, even when we're no longer around, that's the idea of legacy. And how do we develop impact in such an extraordinary degree that people benefit from our lives in all kinds of areas. This is us going to be stacking a couple of ideas. What I've learned is that our intentions really matter. For those of you who have read the book, we talk a lot about um, you know, enhancing the quality of our intentions and that there's sometimes, let's bring the live scribe up, that there can be a gap between my intentions and my actions. 
I don't know about you, but I, in the most part, don't have bad intentions. I really don't. Like, I'm just not one of these people that gets out of the bed and thinks to myself, I just want to go and like destroy that person's life. Like revenge is not a part of the way that I see the world. Like it's just not how I factor in. In the most part, I have great intentions. And in that regard, I would love to be defined by the quality of my intentions because I plan to eat healthy. I want to be a good dad. I mean to be a wonderful husband. Like you see my point, the quality of my intentions are sky high, but where I fall down is the gap that exists between my intentions and my actions. And I'm going to be really kind of like robust here. I've learned this about myself that the size of the gap between my intentions and my actions is literally the size of the dysfunction in that area of my life. Now, dysfunction is quite a, a big word, but what it means is that it's just not working. My intentions aren't carrying through to my actions. And so if I want to work at what is working in my life and what is not working in my life, all I need to do is investigate the gap or the alignment between here's my intentions and here's my actions. This is why self-reflection matters. What are my intentions? What are my plans for my health? What are my plans for my personal finances? What are my plans for scaling my business? What are my plans for being a great friend? What are my plans? And then I want to find out if I did a stock take on my actions, is there any evidence whatsoever that my intentions even exist? Because again, the size of the gap between my intentions and my actions is the size of the dysfunction in that area of my life. We know this then, that it's the actions that we take in life that really, really matter. I mean, we've all heard this saying that the road to ruin is lined with good intentions because as much as we love our intentions, they don't count for much in the real world. I mean, if you've ever accidentally offended somebody, and you want to excuse yourself for having done that by saying, yeah, but I didn't mean to upset you. What matters is what we did, not so much what we intended to do. And so with that in mind, our opportunity is to really hone in on our actions and refine those over time to improve the quality of outcomes that we are getting in life. It's our actions that lead to our, the outcomes that we get. And so just so this is not lost on people, our outcomes are a factor of two things. Our outcomes come in two parts. I wonder if you can capture this and write this down for your own self. Our outcomes come in two parts, and this is important. First, there is the results-based outcome of everything that we do. And then there's a reputational outcome of everything that we do. In other words, Outcomes come in two parts. And for us to truly understand the impact that we are having in life and our ability to have legacy and make a difference in people's lives, it is helpful to understand this through the lens of results and reputation. I've seen people, as an example, act in such a way that gets them great results, but work in such a way that it ruins their reputation. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen somebody get good results in the short term, but do it in such a way that it ruins or diminishes their reputation in the long term? I've seen sales managers put potential clients in corners. I've seen sales managers put existing partners in the corner and drive them towards things that they don't really need, that they didn't really ask for. They feel a little bit manipulated. They had a cracking quarter, great results. But at the first opportunity, no one wants to do business with them. We've got to understand that outcomes come in two parts. There's our results-based outcome, and then there's a reputational outcome. In the exact same way, I have found that it's entirely possible for us to miss the result that we are going after in the short term, but get a great reputation over the long term based on how we are acting. And what I've found is that it's the reputation that paves the way for future results. So we are looking to optimize our actions in ways that create great results, sure. 
But sometimes the way that you go about things, you might miss the result. But do it in such a beautiful way that you build a reputation along the way. That, repeated over time, that's your impact. That is the impact. Hmm. Your impact repeated over time, that is your legacy. And I love this idea because there's so many folks talk about legacy as though it's this ideal for them, but they don't exactly know how to get it done. This is how we do it. And the best area for exploration is literally this one here. Where do we come back to? It is exploring the gap between my intentions and my actions. The more I'm willing to understand the relationship between what I want to do, what I plan to do, and hold myself accountable to making sure that they follow through into my actions, the more all of the rest of these beautiful things becomes possible. Hmm. In that regard, again, we return to this mantra of do less better. High performance will ask of you to just focus on a few things. And so it's really, really important that we are willing to say no to things that don't matter, that we have the courage to do less of the things that are distracting us from what matters most, and to be able to look at our days and our weeks and our months and be robust with us. Hey, you said that you valued health. Where exactly does that show up in the diary? Hey, you said that you were gonna optimize your finances. Where is the action that actually supports that? And so that we don't fool ourselves by having beautiful and noble intent, but that really never shows up in our behaviors. And again, we're not trying to get good at everything. <laughs> We're trying to do less better. We're going to hone in on the things that matter most to us. And so with that in mind, I'd like to share a story from Warren Buffett. This is a, this is a true story. It's a cliched and wonderful story, but it turns out to be very, very true. Warren Buffett's pilot asked him after five years of service, had been very kind, been very, very diligent, very, very professional. And Warren Buffett's pilot after five years of service, without having too much conversation over those years, he asked him, hey, Mr. Buffett, can I just get some advice? Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a good pilot, but I'm trying to grow my household. I'm trying to grow my family and impact over time. Uh, and I don't know where to start. You know, like I, I was in the military uh, and now I've been flying these commercial luxury things and it's really wonderful, but how do... How do I make that next step? And Warren Buffett obviously is famous for being a great and long-term thinker, very rational in his thinking. And he said, here is exactly how you do this. It wasn't even like, there was no hesitation. Here's how you do it. He said this, and have a look at the screen. He said, write down 25 goals for yourself that you want to achieve in your life. And this is what I would encourage you to follow Warren Buffett's ideas as well. I think this is a real beautiful idea. He said, find 25 things that you would love. These are like your bucket list goals for life that by the time you finish up and you finish up strong, you look over your shoulder, there's 25 things that you would love to do. And he said, no, 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 go and do it. Like go and write those things down. And so the pilot literally went away and wrote those list of 25 goals. He came back to him on another day and he said, Mr. Mr. Buffett, I've written down my 25 goals. And he's like, okay, are they in order? And he's like, yeah, they're in order. You know, the first one is like my highest priority. The second one after that and all the way through, these are the things that I wanna do most with my life. And then Warren Buffett said, okay, great. Here's what to do now. Cross out 20 of them. Because <laughs> you don't have enough time. Those 20 things are the very things that are gonna stop you from getting the five things that actually matter most to you in life. Whew. Isn't that good and simple advice? Because I didn't know about you, but there are a thousand lives to live, isn't there? There's so many things that I would love to do in life and with my life, but I know that that's not possible. And so what is important to me is honing in on the stuff that matters most and having the courage to say no to things that don't move me towards the stuff that matters most. I'm going to say this one again. It doesn't matter how well we do the wrong things. 
I don't want to be world class at stuff that I don't care about. And over time, the stuff that matters most is exactly what you are hearing your heart talk to you about right now. Family, health, contribution to a community that you care about. Stack those things and invest into those things. And you will find that life backfills provision, connections, opportunity. Life has an uncanny way of rewarding people who are prepared to give their best to things that matter. And let's be fair, imagine in the top five, your business was one of those things. I mean, of course, that's the way that it happens, isn't it? I care for my family. So how do I show that I care for my family? By providing for them. So I go to work with discipline and I get the balance right. My personal circumstances have been crafted in such a way, I've got a six-year-old daughter and a two-year-old boy. And the OG parents that I trust and love and whose advice I listen to, they say, hey, Phil, just a reminder. And one particular dad says this to me all the time. Hey, Phil, just a reminder. The best way to raise a 16-year-old girl is 10 years ago. And I love this idea that if I'm not showing up for my kids now when they're two and six at this time in their life, woo, we're gonna have chaos in front of us in 10 years time. Is anybody with me, yes or no? And so I know that what matters most right now is yes, making sure my business thrives, of course, because there's provision, but I'm not gonna do that at the expense of things that I will regret, will regret later on. You know, Dan Flynn is a friend. Dan Flynn from Thank You, and shout out to the extraordinary Thank, thank You team. team. You know, Thank You Water, Thank You Hand Wash, they do extraordinary things in the community. They give tens of millions of dollars away every single year. And Dan Flynn, I remember this many years ago when Xander was coming into our life. Xander is our six-year-old daughter, so our first. And he said, Phil, here's some hot tips with regards to parenting. He said, I know it's unsolicited advice, but I wanna give it to you nonetheless. He said this, do what only you can do. And I think this is genius advice for all of us, regardless of whether this is family or business or life. Do what only you can do. And you know what? I said, yeah, that's great. Good. Thanks. Thanks for the advice. Yeah, cool. So this is about delegation, right? So, you know, like give to other people the things that you, you know, like that they could do better. And he's like, no, 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 no. This runs a lot deeper than that. You need to understand that there are certain roles and functions that you have in life that literally only you can do. Only you can be husband to Jess. Only you can be dad to your daughter and your son. Only you can be the leader of your business. It's called Nosworthy Group for goodness sake. So whatever you do, do the things that only you can do. Is anybody with me? I think there's genius in this. And what he said then was, so therefore, do now what can only be done now. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Do now what can only be done now. And I think this takes some discipline and some courage and a lot of patience for ourselves, but do now what can only be done now. He said this, there's this opportunity that you'll find, I don't know how you all are going there, and I apologize, I didn't mean to turn this into a parenting conversation, but it, it runs a little bit deeper than this. Take the ideas and apply it to other areas of your life. You know folks who are like maybe on their phone when uh, their kids, uh, going, hey, come and play with us. And you're like, nah, I'm just looking at social media here. Um, do now what can only be done now. There's gonna come a time in for my kids where they're not gonna ask me to play anymore. And I'm emotionally bracing myself for that time ahead of time. I know that, but there's gonna come a time when they stop asking me for that. And you know what I'm gonna be grateful, grateful for having done? Played with them when that was on the cards. Because this, can wait. Phone calls, man, that can wait. The email, it really can wait. Because the second that they go to bed, I can call people back. The second that they've gone to bed, that's when I can like smack back on the emails that I like was chasing my tail on. But there's one opportunity to show up in ways for the things that matter in those moments. So do now what can only be done now. And in that way, what you'll find yourself having done is stack ranked 
a list of goals that really matter to you. And even in smaller moments, being able to prioritize the stuff that matters in the moment so that you don't give the best of yourself to things that do not matter. So that what? Let's put this to the screen, Ryan, because I'm gonna do this kind of like in a fun way. Just a reminder to do less. Let's all put it together. Better, right? Let's not become world-class in things that do not matter. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna get off my soapbox at the moment and I'm gonna ask in the chat, what's showing up for people? What are their reflections? What are the big aha moments? Because remember, we're just having fun today. This is unscripted stuff because for those of you who haven't yet delved into this, I don't think, I think this is the best way for you to consume this and in your own reflection. So chase these insights. I'm telling you, it's the same stuff that some of the most senior leaders on planet Earth within Fortune 5 organizations are doing. And if you've ever thought to yourself, man, I wish I knew what they knew, this is the stuff that they're working on. Two Fortune 10s are using that at an executive level at the moment. You can too. It's an invitation to do this. Melanie says this, I've got four little ones. Holy smokes, Melanie. Uh, and this is hitting home so deeply as I navigate new business around my family life. Yeah, that's a balance, right? That's a juggling act. And I know this, that it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough. I'm okay with that because we're tough too. Is that fair? It can be challenging because we're up to the challenge. And I know that the stuff that matters most is gonna ask the most of us. So let's not shy away from this. Carly says this, to stop procrastinating and start doing and not being afraid to do it. Thank you for your wisdom. You're welcome. Um, what I love about this wisdom is that it's my grandma's. Isn't this stuff that we already know? Isn't that the beautiful thing? Is that this is like, this is not like, oh, wow, I've never heard this idea before. And this is the most beautiful thing about deep and true knowledge is that it's stuff that we know that when we allow ourselves to sit with it and go slow, that we can do less better. I am convinced that the world has become addicted to sophistication because it excuses us from doing simple things. Ooh. Can I say that again? We've become addicted to sophistication because it excuses us from doing simple things. And you'll have noticed this yourself, that convergence, the strap line for convergence is simple things done savagely well. Because I'm convinced that the better portion of life and success and joy and fulfillment and abundance and impact is going to come out of stuff that seems simple <laughs> that we otherwise resist and procrastinate on. Great health within our control. It's great sleep within our control. Time with people we care about within our control. Slowing down to read instead of like numbing ourselves, turning our brains to custard in other ways. Simple. These are the things that we'll be grateful for having done. But I'm convinced that without doing the simple things first, we'll convince ourselves inadvertently that there must be something else that I'm missing. And this is why the world is so addicted to secrets and inside knowledge. And then when you find yourself in those rooms, you go, oh, this is not really a secret. This is just like good old fashioned basic stuff. And you're like, yeah, because even elite performance comes down to doing simple things savagely well. And for that reason, that's why we wanna do less better, gosh, starting to get a little bit repetitive here, but this is where the magic happens. Because one of the greatest teachers that I know said, hey, when you're getting tired of saying it, that's when people are just starting to hear it. Do less better. Stock take, stack rank, what matters? Not just over life, but what matters now? And do I have the courage to hone in on those things? and balance out doing things now that my future self will thank me for. For you to cultivate a genuine relationship with the you of five years, I'm not talking about you and you know, like sitting on that rocking chair, like at the end of the day, that's great. I love that idea of the sunset you, but I'm also really interested in living the goodness of life now. So who are you in five years time 
And what are the decisions that you are making today that enable that person to be? What will you do today that your future self will thank you for? This is what we're interested in doing for family, for health, for life, and for success. And so tell me, 1.22 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, what's showing up for folks? Would you put a comment in the chat? Will you put a question in the chat? Will anybody argue with me about these ideas? Because I don't mind. We want to have a conversation here as much as possible. So why don't you put uh, some of your commitments into the chat? What matters to you in this conversation right now? And we'll, uh, we'll wait patiently for those ones to hear. You know the thing about procrastinating Carly? There's a wonderful author, Stephen Pressfield, who I've loved for years and years and years. And uh, strangely enough, he's having a new resurgence. And I love this. He's been an author in the public uh, space for a good 35 years. And one of the great podcasters on the planet has just started trumpeting him again. So he's having another best-selling moment. But Stephen Pressfield wrote a book called uh, The War of Art. Not The Art of War. That's Sun Tzu. The War of Art. This is Stephen Pressfield. And he says, you know what stands between you and your highest potential? It's something called resistance. And resistance is very real. Resistance with a capital R, Stephen Pressfield says. And resistance, Pressfield says, it can't be seen, it can't be, f it can't be tasted, it can't be smelt, Ooh, but it can be felt. And it's a repelling force that stands between you and a work in potential. You and the work that you are here to do. Have you noticed ever that for the work that matters most to you, that you will procrastinate on that the longest. That you will find any reason to do anything else except to sit down and do the work that will really make the biggest impact to who you are over time. And Stephen Pressfield personifies that and calls it resistance with a capital R. He says, acquaint yourself with this feeling and overcome resistance. He says, the proportion of resistance that you experience against the work and potential, whether it's a book, whether it's a marketing campaign, whether it's a new business, whether it's a new hobby. He says the size of the resistance to that thing directly equates to the importance of that thing for the development of your soul. And so if you want to find out the super highway for your highest potential and growth is find the things that freak you out the most that you are actively resisting the most, the things that you are procrastinating on the most, and go and do those things. Whew. And I love the simplicity of it. Isn't this wonderful and useful? You can literally orient yourself in life. You're like, okay, where do I go? Which direction do I go? Find the thing that freaks you out the most, the thing that you have stubbornly resisted the most, and go and do that thing, and watch your life change in an instant. Overcoming resistance is the pathway forward to your highest potential and growth. And so with this 125, I'm going to encourage you again and again and again, because you know that I'm not selling you this stuff. These are ideas that I believe in. These are ideas that I've seen change people's lives. And it's not because I think I'm special or different. Holy smokes. My grandma, Betty Thorgood, I reckon she wrote most of this book for me when I was seven, nine, ten years of age. She said, Phil, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. What are you going to do with these skills of yours? Who are you going to be? You want to be that kind of kid? Like this is harnessing and distilling simple wisdom that changes people's lives and creates the opportunity for wild and deep impact. So I would invite you, final thoughts in the chat, and then I'm going to hand back to Celine. So final thoughts. Uh, final questions, final commentary, and then my encouragement is go and do the things. There's videos in there, there's a journal there for you to practice. This is simple, it's designed to be an airport read. This thing you can read it in like 50 minutes because it's not the sophistication of the idea, it's your willingness to put it into practice that matters. So final thoughts, Melanie said this, so excited, thanks so much, you're so welcome. Um, Zeal says this, I love how simple and practical everything you're saying is. Yeah, I agree, because you know what? I think sophistication is overrated. I would much rather be good at stuff that I can understand. And it just so turns out that health 
relationships, business has choreography to it. You can learn the steps and you can get good if you're prepared to do the work. Carly says this, I'm gonna go back to basics, be more present, stop worrying what people think. Isn't that a beautiful thing? There's a chapter in here about the gap between identity and reputation that'll serve you really, really well there. The final chapter, the convergence of confidence and courage, how to detach from some of these crutch emotions that we have. All emotions are beautiful. They're all data for us in regards to orienting our lives, but we don't wanna get addicted to feelings of confidence when a lot of the time it's courage that we're gonna to need to grow. Kuzia, thank you heaps, you're so welcome. I'm Celine, I'm gonna hand back to you right now. Phil, thank you so much. Uh, I just, again, and that's what I love about your work, it's, it's profound yet simple. You know, it's like, it is things that, look, I think if every one of us was looking inside, we realized we know mm. these truths because they, they speak to your soul. So as soon as you say them, you know that actually that is the truth. And so so often I think in the world, I, I put a, a thought in there at one stage, the world that we live in tries to overcomplicate. I love the words you talked about, you know, sophistication and all the rest. And yet it comes back to the true, honest to God, mm. everyday behaviors that we do how we show up, how we treat people, all of those things flow through completely through our lives, how we show up as a partner, a, a, um, a parent, a business person, you know, everything that we actually get to do, it has got that flow and effect. And I loved the diagram where you talked about intentions and action, you know, and then those outcomes, results and reputation, you know, how do people see us in the world? But, you know, again, it's not about how everyone sees us. It's actually the important about the people that matter to us and the people that we're actually trying to get, you know, like, um, I suppose, attract into our lives. Uh, again, as each of you as Juice Plus partners, you don't need to be all things to everybody. You just need to be the things, you know, important and relatable and warm to the people that you actually want to attract to you. Um, and we can try to be all things. Um, I just love, I love also too, that if we think about it, if we listen to what Phil said, it comes back into that flow on how we do show up will impact our results, but it will also create what we, how we get to impact the world. And that's the legacy I think we all want to leave when we, when we, you know, leave this planet and go on to the next part of our journey, we want to know that we made a difference, that people, you know, remember us. And that's exactly what this is. And, and this work, as I said, simple but profound, is the reason why we invested in it. You know, we want for each of you as our Juice Plus partners, it's not just about, you know, you building bigger Juice Plus businesses. It's actually more important about the impact that we get together to make together as a community on the world. That's the reality of it. Because if we know that if Juice Plus, our company is known for actually wanting to make an impact through everything that we do, not just selling some boxes of Juice Plus, but through everything that we do. Well, you know what? That'll be definitely one of my big five goals um, ticked off uh, the box on that. So Phil, thank you so much for just who you are and how you show up in the world every day and how you impact um, you know, through every time that you drop another pearl of wisdom and your children are blessed to have you as a dad. Thank you, team. Can we light up the chat with thank yous for yeah. Phil? Grateful. And I can't wait to share this uh, recording with everybody else as well. All righty. Take care. God bless everyone. Bye for now. See you.